Section 1.2, Basic Classes of Functions. In particular, we're going to talk quite a bit about linear functions because this is going to come up over and over again in Calculus 1 concepts. We're actually going to be talking about slopes of tangent lines, and so we'll be talking about slope a whole lot. So to begin with, slope of a line is a measurement of the steepness of the line. We use the formula m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 to find the slope of the line through the points x1, y1, x2, y2. We often write that as delta y over delta x, the change in y divided by the change in x. All right, the point slope form is this equation here, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 quantity there, and that is the point slope. It tells us the slope and a point that that line passes through. That is of great importance. And then the slope intercept form is y equals mx plus b, where b is the y intercept and m is our slope. So given two points on a line, 11, negative 4, and negative 4, 5, find the slope of the line. That's our first step here. So to find the slope, we will take 5 minus negative 4 divided by negative 4 minus 11. I'll go ahead and label these points, x1, y1, x2, y2, and that comes out to be 9 over negative 15, which reduces to negative 3 fifths, reducing that by 3. All right, there's part 1. Find the slope. The point slope form. I'm going to go ahead and use the first point. I'm actually going to, to settle on that one for this portion. So 11, negative 4, and a slope of negative 3 fifths. y minus y1, so this will be y plus 4, equals negative 3 fifths x minus x1, which happens to be 11. All right, for part c, we want to find the slope intercept form. So we're going to rearrange this equation, distributing that, so negative 3 fifths x plus 33 over 5, y plus 4, and subtracting 4. Just go ahead and write that. I'm distributing that. Subtracting 4, that would be 20 fifths. 20 fifths. So that would be 13 fifths. And that would be y. So that is our equation in slope intercept form. Okay. Example 2 Jessica leaves her house at 5 50 a.m. and goes for a nine mile run. She returns to her house. Turns to her house at 7:08 a.m. Answer the following questions, assuming Jessica runs at a constant pace. So first, describe the distance in miles she runs as a linear function of her time. So we actually want an equation that is d of t equals something in terms of t. Now to do that, we need to look at the two points we have. It's not obvious we have two points, but at time zero, 5:50, that's her start she has gone no distance. Okay, so at time zero, her distance is zero. Now, for the 7.08, okay, after, at 7.08, by that time, she has run nine miles. And that is actually 78 minutes. Going from 5.50 to 6, that's 10 minutes. From 6 to 7, 60 minutes, plus 8. So that'd be 78 minutes. So our distance Actually, our slope, let's find our slope here. That is 9 minus 0 over 78 minus 0. So our slope is 9 78ths, which reduces to 3 26ths. 3 26ths. Now, the y-intercept is actually 0, 0. It's the origin, because at time 0, the distance she's traveled is 0. Now, to sketch this graph, I draw this very roughly. It goes through the point 0, 0 and has a slope of 3 26ths. So it increases 3 in the y direction. That's the change in y. The change in x is 26. So there is our function. Really it's restricted t greater than 0 because we're not too concerned about that. But that should be the graph of that equation. All right, example 3. Oh, not yet. Interpret the meaning of this slope. What does it mean for her distance function to be 3 26th t? Well, that means that every minute, 
Okay, because we're talking, we are talking uh, miles divided by minutes. Okay, our y is in miles, or our our dt is in miles, and our time is in minutes. So this is actually miles per minute. So that slope means that she is running at a rate of 3 twenty-sixths of a mile per minute. Now at the beginning we assumed that she was going to be running at a constant pace. That's where this came in. 3 miles per minute. So this is actually her average velocity. Her average velocity there. Okay, example 3. For the following functions we have three things to do. Describe the behavior of f of x as x goes to plus or minus infinity. Find all zeros, that's our second thing. And sketch the graph. All right, well, the behavior at infinity or plus or minus infinity depends on two things. One, the highest exponent or the degree. Okay, so the degree of part a is two. It's a quadratic. So an x squared, so we have these two, three parts here. First, our graph is going to look like either, because it's an x squared, either a parabola opening up or a parabola opening down. That actually depends on the a value. The a is negative 2. So if a is greater than 0, then it's going to open up. If a is less than 0, then it's going to open down. So this one is going to open down, and so it's going to look a lot like this second one. Here, let's only box this in. It's going to look something like this. Now, the second part of this is find all zeros. So let's take this equation as we did previously. Set it equal to zero and solve that equation. Now, I'm actually going to use the quadratic formula here, okay, which is x equals negative b plus or minus the square root b squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a. So in this case, my x value is going to be negative b, negative 4, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all divided by 2a, which simplifies to negative 4 plus or minus something over negative 4. And that is going to be 8, 16 minus, it ends up being minus 8, which will reduce negative 4 plus or minus 2 root 2 over negative 4, which means our x values are, I'm just going to go ahead and factor out a negative 2 here. I'll factor out a negative and a 2. So 2 plus or minus the square root of 2 over 2. All right, so those are my zeros. Now, sketching the graph, I know where my zeros are. They are at 2 plus square root of 2 over 2 and 2 minus square root of 2 over 2. All right, so an estimate of that is, I believe, 0 0.707. 2 plus square root of 2 divided by 2 at 1.707. So at 1, 1.707, we have... 1x intercept. Right now, 2 minus square root of 2 divided by 2 is 0.29. Something like this. Now, this function opens down, so our function is going to have to look something like this. Something like that. I'm sure that's not exact, but I could find another point to find, or the vertex to get a better picture, but I'm going to leave it at that. Right, part B, same idea. Oh, actually, let me rephrase my part A. I just realized I need to write that more precisely. So in the terms of our function, this means as x goes to infinity, or as x goes to negative infinity, our f of x values are going to negative infinity. So if you go going to the left, if we go to our left, 
our function values are going to negative infinity. And as x goes to positive infinity, f of x goes to, so as we go to the right, our x values are also going to, or y values are going to negative infinity there as well. All right, so part one for this, because this is a third degree polynomial, third degree polynomial, we have two choices here. It'll either look, it's not very smooth, like this or like this. So for the first, that would be a greater than zero, and for the second, it'd be a less than zero. Our a value here is one, which means our function is going to look something like this. So the precise way to write that would be as x goes to positive, let's go to start with negative infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, f of x goes to negative infinity. And as x goes to positive infinity, f of x goes to positive infinity. That gives us a picture of what it's going to look like. Now, we next want to find our zeros. This gives us a, another plate thing we can use to plot this or to sketch this graph. All right, so x cubed minus 3x squared minus 4x equals 0. Factoring an x out of this, x squared minus 3x minus 4 equals 0. Now that factors as x minus 1 and plus 4. Actually, no, I need that to be a negative 3. That's actually, that multiplies to be positive 3. Adds to be positive 3. So let's erase this one. Plus 1 minus 4. And we have our x term, which this tells us x equals 0, x equals negative 1, and x equals 4. You have three x-intercepts. It is a cubic, so it can have up to three, up to three solutions. So my graph, I have a point at negative one, a point at zero, and a point at four. Go ahead and label those three. And it's going to pass through those three, but we also know it's going to go increasing. It's going to be increasing to the right. So it must come this way down this way, and back up to pass through those. And again, for a better, a better picture, I might actually graph this with a calculator or get plot more points, but for now, this is good enough for a sketch. All right, example four. A company's interested in predicting the amount of revenue it'll receive depending on the price it charges for a particular item. Using the data from a table that's actually in the textbook, check out OpenStax Calculus Volume 1 if you want to see all the information there. The company arrives at the following quadratic function to model their revenue as a function of price, as long as P is between 0 and 25. Predict the revenue if they sell an item at a price of $5 or at a price of $17. Well, that would mean I need to plug in, evaluate this function at 5, which is negative 1.04, 5 squared plus 26 times 5, which is 104. Now, it's actually stated in the problem that the revenue, R of P, is in thousands of dollars. So that actually means we're going to have a total revenue of $104,000. Now, R of 17, do the same thing, negative 1.04, 17 squared plus 26 times 17. That is going to be 141.4, and because we're talking in thousands, 141,400 is our revenue there. Okay, find the zeros of this function and interpret the meaning of those. So let's, now, they are actually already gave this to us in factored form. So we want to set P 
p times negative 1.04 uh, p plus 26 equals 0, which means that p equals 0, or p equals, and if we set that equal to 0, subtract 26, divide by negative 1.04, we get 25. So we have two zeros. These indicate the places where if they are ch they're charging nothing, if their price is zero. If their price is zero, then clearly they're not making any money because they're giving away their items. Okay, so let's add that in here. So P equals zero means the items are free, which means no revenue. Okay, if the price is $25, what happens there is our price is too high. Too high a price. Which means no revenue. No one's buying. So we can sketch this graph based on those two points. And I've actually inserted a graph here. We have our points P equals 0, P equals 25, and we know that it's a negative coefficient here. It's negative 1.04 P squared, so it's a parabola facing down. So it will look something like that. Now, this is actually pretty accurate because it's computer generated, and actually, it's actually in the book. Now, use that graph there to, de to determine the value of P that maximizes revenue. Well, the maximum revenue occurs right there. Now, we know, because this is symmetric, okay, that halfway in between those two, 0 and 25, is the sweet spot of price that will maximize the revenue. So we know halfway between. So our price at the maximum revenue is 1250. Again, halfway between 0 and 25. Now, to find the actual maximum revenue, we need to evaluate this, R of 1250, which is $162,500. Evaluating the same way we did in part A. Our next example, example 5, for each of the following find the domain and range. Okay, now I'm going to use knowledge that I have about these different types of functions to to do some things here. So first, our domain. We talked about this in a previous section. We have a vertical asymptote here. So our x value cannot be negative 2 fifths. It can't be negative 2 fifths because that would make our denominator 0. Alright, so in a similar fashion, we actually have a horizontal asymptote at 3 fifths because it's 3x over 5x. The, the ratio of those two coefficients, because the degrees are the same, 3 fifths is a horizontal asymptote, so our function actually never reaches 3 fifths. So our domain is everything except negative 2 fifths, and our range is everything except 3 fifths. All right, part B, because this is a square root function, to find my domain, I need to validate here that 4 minus x squared is greater than or equal to 0. That is what values I can plug in. So if I rearrange this a bit, that would be x squared is less than or equal to 4. Switching the sign because we divided by a negative there. Well, that means that x is between negative 2 and 2. Okay. So that means our domain, I'm going to go ahead and write this in interval notation, is negative 2 to 2. Now the question is, what about our y values? Well, we can sort of trace this backwards. That x being between negative 2 and 2 means that x squared is less than 4, which means 4 minus x squared is greater than or equal to 0, uh, which means the square root of Okay, so this means the square root of 4 minus x squared is greater than or equal to 0. So our range is going to start 
at zero. Now, what is the maximum that it gets to? What is the maximum that it gets to? Well, I can go ahead and write this, actually, because the va highest value of, of x is 2. Um, well, let's see, how do we want to say that? The, well, I'm going to go ahead and just tell you that the, the range is up to 2. That's the highest point. Um, and that is at x equals 0, that's our maximum. It's between those two, those two zeros of, of, zero, of negative 2 and 2. And the way that I can say that is if square root of that is... Okay, let me trace this back. I want to make sure this is really clear. So this tells us that x, or that 4 minus x squared, is between 4 and 0. So squaring both sides, okay, squaring both sides, uh, and then doing a, the, taking the, the end of the negative, and then subtracting the 4, that's going to be less than 4, which means that square root of 4 minus x squared is less than or equal to 2. So we're really using a lot of the same information there. So our range is between 0 to 2. In fact, this function looks like this. There's negative 2 and 2. It is actually a semicircle. Example 6. Find the domain of each of these functions. Well, for the first, we know the denominator cannot be 0, so our domain is that x cannot be equal to plus or minus 1. Simple enough. All right, second one, we can do the same thing and set the denominator equal to 0. However, it is never going to be 0. And since that's the only restriction we could possibly have, our domain is negative infinity to infinity. That's pretty simple. All right, the next one, we cannot have a square root of, or an even root really is what's going to be important there, an even root that is less than 0. So 4 minus 3x must be greater than or equal to 0 which means x is less than or equal to 4 thirds, which makes our domain negative infinity to 4 thirds, and we will include that. All right, part D, I said something about an even root just a second ago. This is a cube root, so actually our argument, what we, what we have underneath the root, can actually be negative. So this one has no domain restrictions. It's all real numbers. And again, you can also write all real numbers that way. All right, number seven. Classify the following functions as algebraic or transcendental. Okay, so algebraic functions are a combination, a combination of adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, and square roots. That is what it means to be an algebraic function. So the first has nothing except a square root, cubing, okay, so that's multiplication, and division. So this one is algebraic. All right. Part B is transcendental because it has the exponentiation there, okay, which is a with when it's 2 to the x, okay, that's actually more than just multiplication, it's a slightly different type of function. So this is transcendental. And then the last one, sine of 2x, that one is also transcendental. Okay. Number 8, sketch a graph of the following piecewise defined function. All right, the way this is going to play out is at x equals 1 we have a differing of functions. Okay, so to the left, less than 1, the function is going to look like x plus 3. So I can graph this just like I would any other function, any other linear function. x plus 3 with a slope of 1, so it's going to come up to this point, and I'm going to put a hole there because it's less than 1, and we're not including that point. 
Now to the right of one, we have x minus two squared, which is a quadratic function that has a vertex there at two zero. It's gonna look like this. Now it is going to come up to the point, if I evaluate that at one, that is one. So it's actually going to do something like that. Notice it's equal to on the quadratic side of things and as an open circle or an open dot on the right on the left side of things at the linear function. Let's look at another piecewise function. In a big city, drivers are charged variable rates for parking in a parking garage. They're charged ten dollars for the first hour or any part of the first hour and an additional two dollars for each hour or part thereof up to thirty dollars for the day. The parking garage is open from 6 to 12, 6 a.m. to 12 midnight. Okay, the way this cost function, c of x, is going to be defined, uh, let's write that differently. We have a pretty big function actually. It's $10 as long as x is between 0 and 1, actually including 1, up to that first hour, it's $10. Okay, up to one, it is ten dollars. Well, it's twelve dollars if you are between one and two hours. Fourteen dollars between two and three hours. All the way up to thirty dollars if it is between ten and eighteen hours. So the graph of this function is going to have a lot of holes in it, and here it is. It is $10 between 0 and 1, up, up to, and it's including 1, and then it's $20, $12 between 1 and 2, 14, etc. It jumps by 2 each time. This graph is very discontinuous, if you notice. There are lots of places it is not connected. Lots of places it is not connected. Okay. Our last example. Sketch each of these graphs using a sequence of transformations of well-known functions. All right, so the way I want to do this is I'm going to start out with the absolute value of x. The absolute value of x has this shape. Okay. Now, if I focus first on the, well, I have four parts here, actually. This negative out here reflects it across the x-axis. This plus 2 actually shifts it to the left 2, and this minus 3 moves it down 3. If that was a plus 3, it would move it up 3. Okay. So absolute value of x, there's what it looks like. Let's move it to the left. That would be x plus 2. Okay. So if it's just x plus 2, it's going to look something like that. Well, if we do move on to this next one, absolute value of x plus 2 minus 3. So to the left 2 and down 3. Left 2, down 3. And then if we reflect it, okay, this will be our last function, negative x plus 2, absolute value of x plus 2 minus 3. Reflecting it, we have left 2, down three and reflected. So the graph we actually are after is this very last one. This is the graph we are after because we've applied all those transformations. All right, part B, this plus one will move it up one. This three will actually stretch the graph. If that three were say a one third, it would be a compression. And this negative in here, inside the square root, is a reflection, just like we had a second ago, but it's going to reflect it across the y-axis. So this function is going to start out as the square root of x. Okay, square root of x, we're going to move it up 1. So start at 1. We will go ahead and reflect it 
across the y-axis. So instead of going to the right, it's going to the left. And then we're going to stretch it. Now, the stretch may not be visible on my sketch here. It's going to do something like that. It's going to increase in height. The way as it goes, as it increases, it's going to go faster. So this is my last graph in that sequence. Okay, that brings us to this section on basic classes of functions. Um, watch this again and again if there are certain parts that don't make sense to you, but these, we're going to use these concepts regularly throughout the semester.